book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 1. Second Peter chapter number one. And we'll begin reading in verse number one. I want to start uh, dealing with the doctrine of spiritual development or growth and what the Bible says about uh, Christian maturity the need for Christian maturity. And so I hope that uh, this morning we'll start approaching that subject, look at that a little while. We're coming to the end of the year, believe it or not. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> it's amazing how fast time goes by. Uh, but I want to encourage you uh, to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I hope that uh, in the next few weeks as we look at this subject, you'll see how important that is and you'll see how that you can actually mature, and so I trust that it will be a help to you. Spiritual development or spiritual growth. Second Peter chapter 1, let's begin reading in verse number 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. This is Second Peter chapter number 1, verse number 3. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity, or love. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them and be established in them in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet, as long as I am in this tabernacle or this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Christ has showed me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and just the privilege of gathering together in freedom in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we take that tremendous blessing. Lord, we just take it for granted as Americans. And, and we uh, don't show the uh, gratitude that we ought to show to you for that tremendous blessing of being able to assemble together and worship without uh, the fear or threat of uh, government intervention. And, Lord, you've given us great freedoms and great blessings, and we ask that we might use them for your glory. Uh, Lord, I pray this morning that you would help each of us. Lord, help those that may be in this service that are lost and they do not know Christ, and they've not been born again. Their life has not been changed. Lord, work in their heart. Help them that they might respond to your word today and come to Christ, that they would be saved in this very service. And God, for the Christians who are here, stir every one of us. God, help us to grow. Challenge us. 
Lord, those that have kind of settled in and are satisfied, stir their hearts like never before and grip them. And Lord, help them that they might once again pursue after you and desire a, a better relationship with you. Help them that they might leave this service with a new, renewed determination by the grace of God to add to their faith. And Lord, just speak to our hearts. Help me this morning. Lift up the wonderful name of Jesus and we pray that you would be glorified. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Some people seem to believe that once a person becomes a Christian, that is a, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, that spiritual development is automatic. It's going to take place once you've been born again. It's just a natural outflow of life. You're going to continue to progress until one day we go home to be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. There are some things that we would hope that would be true, and I would hope that that was true, but we know by experience that that's not the case at all. Not everyone that's saved continues to grow and develop. In fact, in our generation, in our day, many who come to a genuine salvation experience, we're not talking about false conversions or fake faith, we're talking about people who have truly been born again. Multitudes of them are not developing and maturing as God wills for them to mature. They are staying in an infant state far too long. In fact, I'm afraid even for our church family, that's the case for more of us than there ought to be Many of us have not gone on and developed into spiritual maturity like we should have. Many are stagnant and not developing at all. And for some reason we think that's really not a big deal. I mean, after all, I'm saved, right? Seems to be the thinking of some. And I'm not going to burn in hell forever. Hallelujah. And so I got that marked off the list. So why should I be so concerned about becoming a better Christian, more Christ-like, showing the world what genuine Christianity is? And I just want to warn you over and over and all throughout the Bible, there's an exhortation, there's a strong command for you not to stay in the infant state, but move from that state to a better relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and, a, and, a, and a, a better walk with Him than what you have today. And it should be the desire of every born-again Christian to get as close to Christ as we possibly can in this world. Amen? Amen? And when you think about Christian growth in that light, you see then the danger of not growing. It's not that you're just neglecting spiritual things. You're not just neglecting spiritual topics. The reality is we are neglecting Christ himself. And there, there lies the great danger of not becoming more like Jesus Christ, not developing into the fullness of the stature of Christ, but just staying down here in the infant state far too long. My prayer this morning and desire is that God would grip your heart and that you would see I cannot stay where I'm at. I must go forward. I must grow. I must become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And the truth is, the strongest, most mature Christian here should have that earnest plea even in his heart. Amen? I can't stay the same. I want to be more like Jesus Christ. Well, once the new birth takes place, we think it's like a little natural-born child. They just grow and develop. But if you stop and think about that, that is not the truth, is it? Even with a physical child, right? That physical child is not going to do well if they're not loved, cared, uh, cared for, provided for, nourished. If they're just abandoned and no one else does anything for them, they will perish. Isn't that true? And you can't look at your spiritual life and think that that's an exception. 
Because the Bible tries to get us to see that as physical things affect the physical body, so spiritual things affect the spiritual man. And that's all throughout your Bibles. Amen? Remember even in 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 2, you might remember this verse, verse number 2. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. So said, now, just like an infant, when it's first born, and how many have ever had the privilege of being uh, with a mother and then the child comes into the world and the child's first born? Raise your hand if you ever had the privilege of being there when the child was first born. Well, nowadays, more husbands are raising their hands than one they used to be. We used to be able to wait out in the hallway and get the news, but now we have to be involved in it. You know, that's our role. It's changed. I don't know who changed it, but if I ever meet them, I'm going to chase them about it. <laughs> but you know, as soon as that child is born, right, minutes old, it starts moving its head around, and it's, it's expressing a desire immediately, what? to be fed. You don't have to teach it to have that desire. You don't have to put up a screen and say, now this is what you're supposed to do. It's just a natural outflow. When that infant's born, there's an in intense desire uh, to be fed. It doesn't have to be created. It is there. And Peter said, as that newborn child naturally desires to be fed its mother's milk, the same thing's true about a born-again Christian. There should be the desire on the part of a Christian to be fed with spiritual food so that they could develop and grow and mature. The Bible does this all throughout the Scriptures. Isn't that true? It shows us the effect on the physical body. Remember Paul trying to talk to young Timothy and use for the young man athletic terms. He said, Timothy, bodily exercise profiteth little. And he's saying, now, you know, Timothy, if you get out there and you run and you exercise and you do your push-ups and your pull-ups and your sit-ups, you know it's going to transform your body. You know it will affect you. You will see some enhanced ability. You will see gained strength you'll see immediate improvement. The more you exercise your body, the stronger that body is going to be. And he said, uh, Timothy, don't worry so much about improving your physical body. Exercise thyself rather unto godliness. Timothy, spend some time exercising your spiritual muscles. Some of you young, young men here at the church are impressive. Impressive. You muscled up, you know, you're strong young men, and people look at you and think, wow, that's a strong. I hate to get in a fight with that dude, you know? I wonder what they would see if they saw your spiritual man. I wonder if he would look like a little shriveled up fellow, little tiny man. And certainly, Satan knows the stature and nature of your spiritual man, does it? Your physical man, he doesn't worry about that too much, but he knows exactly how you, uh, strong you are spiritually, and you and I need to be more concerned about how is that inner man doing? How's our spiritual man? Is he strong? Is he growing? Are things well? You, you take a little child... If that child has proper nutrition in a healthy environment, right, they're going to do great. They get the right nutrition and they, they have a healthy environment. Most of that's the basic thing. How many would say amen to that? And they're going to do wonderful. Fat cheeks, you know, healthy body. We had, uh, Brenda had a, a niece that had a little child and, and the child just didn't do well at all. And they fed the child and fed the child and it just wouldn't grow, it wouldn't develop and it was looking like it was stunted and they were worried and worried and they and because the child
child wasn't increasing, wasn't gaining weight. In fact, it lost some weight from the time they took it from the hospital to the home, and it kept going down. And you know what they did? They didn't just say, oh, well, that's the natural thing. They rushed the child to the doctor, went back time and time again, and they said, listen, you've got to help us figure out what's wrong. Something is wrong. And they finally figured out what was wrong. And now you can never even tell anything was wrong with the child whatsoever. Amen? You say, why in the world would you mention that? Well, Tommy, because a lot of us are not even concerned enough to go to the doctor spiritually and say, hey, I am in a bad state. I'm not developing. I'm not growing. I'm weak. I'm in danger. I need some help. You should be developing spiritually. If you're not developing spiritually, that should be a cause for great alarm in your life. When Peter says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, he's not just talking about uh, desiring to go to a football game or desiring to go out and picnic. He is talking about an intent desire. A very strong desire. Not just an I wish type of desire, but an intense, overwhelming, passionate desire. In fact, that same word is used a little differently in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 2. And Listen to what Paul's writing here. He says, For in this we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house which is from heaven. Paul said this old body is going to be, uh, it's going to be this tabernacle is going to be laid aside and he said we groan earnestly for that new body we're going to receive. Are y'all getting the point there? Even that desiring sincerely the milk of the word there needs to be an intense groaning an earnest desire I wonder if you can look at your spiritual man when you leave church and you're at the house and you're riding down the road. Is there any intensity of desire about spiritual growth? Is there a hunger for more of God's Word, a better understanding, a greater walk with God? That's how it ought to be. That's the natural state of someone who is doing spiritually well. That's how it ought to be. How many would say amen to that? Now, if that's how it ought to be, you've got to seriously ask yourself the question, how is it with you? If this is how it ought to be, I should be craving, earnestly desiring, hungry. Then when I leave church and I get back in work and I go to school and doing all my stuff that I have to do and then, oh, it's Sunday again and I go to church... Can you look back on this last week, last month? Can you honestly say in my heart of hearts there's been a passionate desire for spiritual growth? And if you can't say that, then you ought to at least be alarmed this morning and say, hey, you know what? That's not the case with me. That means I need to get that little baby to the doctor. I need some help. Because I'm not desiring what I ought to desire. And listen to me, that there's only two things that can be true about that, right? You say this morning, I'm a Christian. And you say, preacher, I really don't have no hunger for the Bible. I don't starve for more. I don't have a great desire for the Word of God. I mean, I, I like it. I care about it. But I mean, I don't have this passionate desire. There's only two things that can be true. One... You're still dead and trespassed in sins and you've never been saved. And think about this. I would to God that some of us would give that some serious consideration. Amen? Because not everybody who's named the name of Christ is going to make it to heaven when they die. And there should be some spiritual truth on the inside that's really basic to every believer. That's the way every believer is. As newborn babes, Peter's saying, most uh, hey, babies are like this, and Christians are like this. This is the basic heart desire of saved people. And if you say, hey, that's not me, then you have to say, something is wrong on the inside. Maybe I never have been saved. 
And I'm not here this morning to cause you to doubt your salvation. But if you have never come to real knowledge of Christ, saving knowledge of Christ, you need to doubt your salvation and you need to get serious about where you're going to spend eternity because time's running out very fast. You don't have much longer to decide you're going to get on the boat or not. Amen. You're going to sign up, you're going, to, you're going to accept Christ, or you're going to just keep putting Christ off. And just because you know the Bible terms doesn't mean that you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. So if you don't have those desires, it may mean that you're unsaved. Secondly, it may mean this. It may mean that you're in a terrible state spiritually. In other words, you're in a dangerous state spiritually. If this is the natural state, hungry, thirsty, desiring, when I get in the car, I don't want to listen to country music, I want to listen to a sermon, I want to listen to spiritual music, I want something good. When I get home, it's not so much about what's on the TV, I, I, I watch it, but I'm more interested in spiritual things. I have to read my Bible, I need to spend some time with God. If that's not the case, if you can live your life like there is no Bible, no Christ, no cross, no resurrection, please examine yourselves to see whether you've been the faith. And if you say, preacher, I know that. I know I've been saved. Then you need to even be more concerned that your heart is in such a cold state. See, we think being backslidden is not that big a deal. Are y'all with me? Is that a true statement or not? He said, well, I'm saved. And so being backslidden is not that big a deal. Listen to me real close now. Being backslidden is worse than not being saved. You say, preacher, why is being backslidden worse than not being saved? Because if your heart is that cold, how far have you drifted from Christ? And are you close to just turning your back on Jesus altogether and forgetting the whole thing? You say, well, preacher, I don't know people do that. Let's do multitudes of people doing that. You go online now, and it's the new fad, it seems like, preachers who are becoming apostates. One of the guys who used to write a lot about the historical Jesus, and there's no doubt Jesus was the character he is. Bart Ehrman wrote much about the Bible. Now all he can write about is attacking the Bible, attacking Christ, because now he says, I'm not a believer, now I'm an atheist. And preachers are announcing, I'm leaving the faith and I'm becoming an apostate. And listen, that's not a badge of honor, that's the Judas Iscariot. That's a badge of betrayal. You've forsaken the truth for a lie. You say, what, what, have, what have they learned that made them turn their back on Jesus Christ? It's not what they learned, it's what they desired. They have desired sin, and you can't have sin and, and the Savior. And so they found some excuse to turn their back on Christ so they can feel the lust of their own filthy flesh. When you are cold and indifferent, you say, well, that's no big deal. You think of the... Uh, lay of the sea in church and what did Jesus say to that church that lukewarm church can you remember what he said to that lukewarm church I would that you were cold or hot I want you to be a distinct difference you need to be right or wrong be in or out tell people what you are what you believe don't be lukewarm. Come to church on Sunday. Hey, Jesus, Jesus, wonderful Jesus, I surrender all. And then go to work on Monday and cuss like a sailor. And go to the parties and drink the beer and live immoral and smoke the junk that this world has to offer and say, well, I got my ticket to heaven. I'm saved. If, that, if you think that's a good condition to be in, Satan has really pulled the wool over your eyes. You say, why do you say that? Well, you, you don't just read First Peter. Read Second uh, Peter chapter one. Read Second Peter chapter two. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they had known the way of righteousness, to turn from that way of righteousness. For the latter end is worse for them than the beginning. 
you turn your back on Jesus after having met Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Listen to me. You reject Christ, there's never going to be another opportunity to get saved and get right with God. I'm not saying the bachelor can't repent and get back, but I'm saying the apostate cannot. And we've seen good Christian people. Listen, we're living in a day of apostasy. We've seen good Christian people, as we are, good Christian people, turn their back completely on Jesus to get away from the church and start living immoral lives. I sat down in the house with one of those dear women that we used to work with, and she taught our kids in Sunday school. Wonderful lady. Great testimony. And now she's abandoned Christ. I went over there with a pastor friend of mine and sat down in her home with her and I said, Sis, you're in a bad state. You can't keep doing what you're doing. God chastens every child that's His. You can't keep living in sin and think that God is not going to bring about a, a, a whooping. You're going to get whooped. He's going to tear your backside up. He didn't let one child just go off and sin like that and not chasten them, not discipline them, not correct them. If you're a child, he's going to correct you. Before I told that, I said, listen to me. I'm pretty a Baptist because pretty a Baptist teach there's a possibility of abandoning your faith. And you can get to a place that you're lost and going to spend eternity in hell. And you know what she taught? I'll tell you, I'll quote her what she taught. I'll tell you exactly what she said. She said, well, I've not done that yet. She didn't say, I'll never do that. She didn't say, hey, why are you talking about? Well, I'm not going to do that. She said, I've not done that yet. I said, well, even if you've not done that yet, you're on the road to it. And God may chasten you. And if you don't fear chastisement, you, something's wrong with you mentally. It's easy when you're up on the 10th uh, floor of the World Trade Center to say, hey, I'd never jump off this 110th floor for nothing. Hey, nothing made me jump out that window. And then the plane crashed through and the fire gets so hot, you say, well, I'm going to take that back. I'd rather jump out of the window than burn up in this building. It's easy to say that when the building's on fire. It's easy to say, well, he chases me, he chases me. But when you're staring down at the casket and you're looking at a child that died because of your sin, that's a big issue. Uh, listen, I'm telling you, God is not to be mocked. He don't just write things in the Bible and say, read that and, and just ponder what it said. You know, it's no big deal. He doesn't write things in the Bible just so you can have something to read. He writes it in there to instruct us. Spiritual development is essential. You can't play around with your soul. You got, you got to get serious about your relationship with God. We're living in days that, that, and listen, you know this is true if you're paying attention whatsoever. Churches all across America, good pastors are really struggling very hard just to get folks to keep coming to church and just to get them to do the basic things. Good pastors are struggling really hard just to get the basic things out of Christians in our day. Not the great things, just the simple things. And listen to me, that's all across America. You're right in the middle of, first, of falling away. And, and we are right in the middle of that. And listen, what I'm pleading with you is don't get caught up in the riptide. You come to church and say, well, where's everybody at? I can't tell you where they're at. But I know where you ought to be. Amen? Amen. <laughs> And I know what what will help you. I know what's good for you. I know what will strengthen you. You say, well, I heard, the, I heard this text I don't know how many times. Peter said, as long as I'm alive. You go back and read it. As long as I'm alive, I'm going to remind you. As long as I'm, I'm, my heart's beating, I'm going to tell you again. I'm going to remind you again. Grow. Fear Satan. Keep an eye on him. Get strong. Grow in grace. Don't go back to the world. If you'll read a little bit later on, he said, and I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave a letter too. So after I die, you can read it again. And that way he said, brother, 
He said, I've heard that before. And it's good for us to hear things over and over again because it stirs our heart. It said, yeah, that's right. I can't keep playing around my soul. I need to get right with God. How many times have you been to the altar because of one sermon subject that you heard over and over again you had to get in the altar and say, you know what, that, the Bible's right. It's not whether he, the preacher's right or not. The Bible's right. This is where my real heart is. And I need some help from God. And when you did that, you went home, stirred inwardly and helped. Amen? What did he say in verse number 5? And beside this, you know what he's saying? Because of these truths, because this is real, this being the case, prior to this, he's made some amazing statements. He said, because this is the case, because this is true, then you need to do something about it because of this truth. Think about the investment that's been made in your life. Think about what Christ has done so that you can have eternal life and forgiveness. Think about how far you've gone. Think about the fact that you're a saved individual and you have eternal life. Think about that. Because that's true, then listen, add to it, build on it, increase, develop, get stronger. Don't get weaker. Don't abandon it. Well, what's true? Well, look back at verse number 4. You have escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. You see, a lot of people in this world, this is what they're living for. They're living for their wants and their desires and their dreams. That's what they're living for. I mean, look, I'm honest with you. I, Pastor Rick said he's a city man, not a city boy. <laughs> and I'm a country man, not a country boy. Once you get past about 87, you're going home for a boy. So. <laughs> We finally reached. <laughs> we finally have a man in our church. We're low as a man. <laughs> and every time I go down home and I drive down the dirt road, which I always despise, bump, 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 and I see hogs out the pen and cows out there, I'm like, oh, why in the world am I doing in Jacksonville, Florida? There's no trees. Up there. I couldn't have a rooster in my backyard if I wanted to. And I want to. <laughs> Can you imagine 4 o'clock in the morning? Mm -hmm. My neighbors would be calling 911. Something's screaming. Something's screaming. I don't know what, I don't know what that was. <laughs> Please talk to my mother. You hear the story about the lady who put her eggs on the cook and boil. And her husband went in the backyard and started cleaning. And all of a sudden, her cow! Credit cards are just maxed out. 
They're living barely paycheck to paycheck, right? And go to their garage and it is stuffed to the ceiling. The attic is overflowing. We've got storage units full of junk, right? And still going online, running that credit card, getting something else. Something. And, th and never learning. Listen, that trap, that prison of things, you're never satisfied in that prison. And Jesus said, I came, I got you out of that. I got you out of that prison of sin and the prison of selfishness and, and sorrow of heart. And you were set free. You were delivered from that. You don't have to live as a slave anymore. I set you free. And, and he said, now listen, then because of that, add to your faith. Why go back and put your arms out and say, put chains on me again, devil? He said, if we ain't Christian do that, what's the third type of soil? Thorny ground. And Jesus said, I threw some seed in there, and boy, that, it sprouted up. It looked like it was going to get some good tomatoes. In country, it's called maters. Maters and taters. Maters. We're going to get some good maters. And it never produces a thing. Why? Because the cares of this life and the pursuit of riches. Christian, have you ever been entrapped by that? Have you ever thought, man, I've gotten into a trap here? And if you're not careful and you're not adding to your faith, you're going to go back and get caught up in the world again. It's not just that, but think about that like precious faith that you have attained. Verse number 1. Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So you have today eternal life. Every one of you who are saved, you have eternal life. You say, preacher, what is eternal life? So that's simple. That means you're going to live eternally in heaven. No. Eternal life is not a, the time that you're going to spend in, in heaven. Eternal life is Jesus Christ. If you have Christ, you have eternal life. If you don't have Christ, you don't have life. Your eternal life, that's not something apart from Christ. It's not that Jesus said, okay, I'm going to give you eternity in heaven and I don't have anything, no, no hands off. You just have... Because what did John write in 1 John chapter 5, verse 12? He that hath a son hath life. And what else did he say? He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. For God so loved the world that He gave. What was the gift that He gave? He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should have everlasting life. Life is Christ. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And the reason you should grow spiritually and continue to develop spiritually is because that relationship with Christ gets stronger and stronger the more you grow. And the weaker you get, the more spiritually weak you become. Guess what happens? Instead of that relationship with Christ getting stronger and stronger, guess what happens? It gets weaker and weaker. And we, you said, preacher, I thought Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. He did say that. I'm so glad. Amen. He's like the com committed spouse. He's like the loving wife to an adulterous husband. Isn't that true? He's like a loving wife, faithful wife to an adulterous husband. She loves him. She cherishes him. She adores him. She wants to spend all of her time with him, all of her life with him. But what does he want? He wants others. Yes, Christ will never leave us nor forsake us. Amen? That's not up for debate whatsoever. The question is, what are you doing with Christ? Are you clinging to Christ? Remember what? Uh, 
Barnabas uh, when he was sent to uh, those Christians at Antioch in Acts chapter 11 and he said, wow, your faith is great. You guys are awesome. This is tremendous. I mean, you really know the Lord. This is a wonderful... And he said, i got one message for you. Christian, why? Cleave to Christ. Don't let go of Him. Hold on to Him. And that's what you need to remember. Spiritual growth is really cleaving to Christ. And Christ, I want you. And I want you more today than I wanted you yesterday. It's not just about learning more facts in the Bible. You can have all the knowledge. You can have a lot of Bible knowledge and be lost and on your way to hell. In fact, let me challenge you. You go back and hear what Peter said. We'll do this in closing, but Peter, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me point it out to you again in verse number 8. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. No, over and over, Peter will refer to that spiritual growth, the spiritual growth as not the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let me just say how he concludes this book in 1 Peter chapter number 3. Listen to what he says in the last section of this uh, epistle. After he warns of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, he says in verse 18, 2 Peter 3, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. When you talk about knowledge in the Bible, you're not just talking about information. You're talking about experience. You're not just talking about facts. You're talking about experience, fellowship. You say, I know Pastor Rick. I can tell, I can make that claim, and that's a pretty accurate claim. I know Pastor Rick, but I don't know him anything like his sons know him. And they don't know him anything like his wife knows him. Right? There's a greater knowledge. The more intimate the relationship, there's, and listen, why are relationships falling apart? Because that's not, there's, that intimacy is not there. The more intimate the relationship, the greater the knowledge, the greater the knowing the greater of the experience you have with that person. You can tell me something, and it's not who you are at all. But the more I have experience with you, the more I find out who you really are. And Christ said, listen, what I want you to do is spend time with me, and I want you to know me. That's not just facts in the Bible. I want you to experience what I can do in your life. Let me deliver you from a load of sin. Come, come here, cast all your care on me and experience what I do when you cast your care on me. Offer up this petition and let me demonstrate my power in answering that petition. And when he answers that specific prayer down to the penny, you say, wow, what experience I just had with God. What a mighty thing God's done. I know Him better today because of what I've experienced with Him. It's not just information. It's intimacy and fellowship and knowing God through life experiences. And that's why he said, grow in those experiences. Well, why, why am I not experiencing more about God? Because I'm living my life and there is no God. I walk out of church, and that's the last time I think about it. I don't pick up my Bible, I don't learn any more about Him, I don't try Him at work, I don't trust Him with my finances, I don't uh, come to Him when I'm being tempted. I never get to see him do anything. Why? Because I'm not looking to him to do anything. Do you understand that? Are you growing in grace? If we could look at your spiritual man, would it be strong or weak? Every single one of us, truth be known, should be in an altar saying, God, help me. Help me to grow. Help me to get closer to Christ. My life is not what it ought to be. 
And I'm, I'm, not, I'm completely unsatisfied with what it's like this morning. Help me. And especially if you're here this morning and you're unsaved, Christ reaches out to you this morning to redeem you, to rescue you, to save you. And all you have to do is come and put your hand in His hand by faith and say, Christ, I want you. I want forgiveness of sin. I want eternal life. I'm giving you my life. Save me. I promise you, you leave this service born again. If you do that, amen? Would you come? Let's stand for prayer.